back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. And more specifically, this is Thursday, Coronaville, what's next? You know, well, there's been a lot of talk about how people are getting tired of all this and they're sort of backing away from it. They, you know, they don't want to engage anymore. They're sick and tired of watching the news. It's so d- depressing. Um, and here we are getting close to the election. You wonder what effect that has on whether people actually are going to vote. At the same time, you know, they get tired of all the confusion about Corona. And uh, we really have to keep going on this. We have to keep studying it because it is happening, whether it's on the news or not, it is happening. And one of the, one of the most remarkable discussions that I've heard recently was uh, Rachel Maddow's response uh, to Trump's uh, you know, repeated suggestion uh, that, that he's going to wait on, um, what is it, uh, herd? He called it herd mentality. Really, he means uh, herd immunity. Um, she made fun of him for that. But, but um, you know, he seems to be adopting a policy of, of herd immunity, which is, you know, incredible. Uh, so last night, remarkable discussion by Rachel Maddow. What do you think, Tim? What, what did she say and how did it affect you? Good morning, Jay. The, uh, the numbers presented for herd immunity is, is, um, is disgusting uh, that this administration may be even considering uh, some type of approach to herd immunity because you take the population of 330 million Americans and you figure that you need somewhere between 65% to 70% to obtain some sort of herd immunity. And then you look at that number and that's about 214 million And then you take the average death rate that we've experienced with COVID-19, which is 2.97%. Again, when you look at all the cases and then divide that by the number of deaths into that number, you come up with 2.97%. Then you take the 214 million times that 2.97, and you come up with over 2 million deaths. Um, Donald Trump said at the town meeting with George Stephanopoulos that... um, uh, COVID-19 is going to go away with or without a vaccine, and that's because it's just going to happen. And what he's referring to is his herd, well, he called it herd um, mentality, but uh, herd immunity is what he really meant. And uh, to, to, co- to co- contemplate 2 million deaths of Americans just because Donald Trump decided he didn't want to address this in February um, is astronomical. And he's, he's relying on the advice and counsel of uh, Dr. Scott Atlas. Who, who is a radiologist and uh, certainly is, no, you know, is not well steeped in, in the nature of viruses and how to conquer a virus. So I find it uh, a poor, uh, you know, de- deplorable as usual about what comes out of the administration and it needs to stop. It, we need to go to tried and true methodologies of preventing this virus from further spread. Masks, contact tracing, uh, social distance separations, things of, you know, these these things that we already know will work. Uh, in fact, the uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Redline, what's his name? Red, Redfield uh, last night said, hey, the tried and true method is wear a mask. If 95% of the population wore a mask, this virus would die out. Yeah, then he backtracked when Trump started attacking him. Trump attacked him for that statement and then he, he backtracked. But going to uh, Red, uh, going to, um, <clears throat> Rachel Maddow's uh, analysis, as I recall, she had something in the order of six million deaths, um, you know, without any amelior- amelioration, um, and she had, with amelioration of some kind, a more optimistic view of it yeah. was closer to one or two million. And <clears throat> and you know, the remarkable thing is that both of these analyses, they're not pie in the sky. They're real numbers based on what's really happening right now, including, you know, multiplication factors of, you know, the number of people uh, who die after the number of people get, get sick. Um, so this is, this, is not, this is not making it up. This is, this is the parameters of what is likely to happen with his um, new policy. It seems to be a new policy, somewhere between 6 million, which is the number of people who were killed in the Holocaust intentionally in Germany, and one or two million, uh, which is more than we've lost in all the wars the country has ever fought, way more, way more, um, <clears throat> which is not actually that far off from, what are we at now, 200,000? Um, so it's, it's going fast. And I think essentially he's acknowledging 
he doesn't really have a plan. He'll just let nature take its course uh, like they did in Sweden. But actually, <clears throat> uh, Cynthia, what happened in Sweden? Did it really work fine in Sweden? No, it did not work out well at all for them. Um, they've had all kinds of turmoil. They've had lots of deaths. They've had surging cases. So obviously, if we're going to follow that sort of example, it shows us, don't do it. Make a different plan. Yeah, you know? well, they changed it in Sweden because they couldn't tolerate all the deaths. Yeah. You know, I, I find it amazing. I mean, if we, if we stopped the show right now and started a count to 200,000, that's the number of deaths already. We'd be counting for weeks, the three of us, as fast as we could. Not even giving names, just counting. Um, and if you try to go to, say, what was it, the, top, the high end, uh, six million, how long would it take for us to count to that? Um, but he doesn't seem to talk about that. He just says anything in order to, you know, defer the issue. I mean, so what happened, uh, Stephanie, something we've talked about before. What happened with, um, you know, uh, uh, Robert, um, um, what's his name, the book recently, Rage. Um, what Woodward. happened with all of, Woodward. yeah, Woodward's book? I mean, uh, Woodward said that uh, Trump knew, and he said he knew that this was a very um, threatening uh, pandemic. Um, and then he took steps on the other side to confuse everybody. Uh, where are we on that? I mean, have we have we gotten to a better time when he's not confusing us, or does the confusion continue? And how should we treat these statements? For example, um, about uh, herd immunity or mentality, whatever. We, we should have learned when he said Mexico was going to pay for the wall. It all, it all stands on that one little point. You can just put the compass point right there. And that was where we laughed. And we thought that's ridiculous, but had no idea that this was the foundation. <laughs> for continuing comments by him. But one of the things um, with what you said about the virus is um, I'm appalled that nobody, everybody's saying, oh, for deaths, we'll have 2 million deaths. Well, what about the 70% of the 330 million that have to be sick? And when you get this, no matter what age, you're gonna be sick for three weeks or a month. So, I mean, nobody's factoring in the fact that even if we did want to try her, her immunity, we would not just have death, but we would have the nation down for a month for each person that died, and that would be even more millions. Yeah, so, what mean, about the hospitals? Great. What about right. the hospitals? What about the healthcare workers? What about the discombobulation to the economy? I mean, I, he didn't seem to mention any of that. No, no it's a whole, the middle piece the whole body of it is un undigested and uncriticized. And where's the media on that? So I'm just appalled at some of these gaps. I guess people are just so worn out. But um, he's also, with Woodward, he was just trying to find out what was going to impress Mr. Woodward. So like he said, he went into that with no advice from his advisors. He just went into the Fox's den and decided to dance around and be cute self, say things and get him to get the person to see him as important and saying things. And uh, he said all the wrong things. And yeah. um, took them all the well, I, I certainly, uh, the question really is, uh, what, how does this play, Tim, between his herd immunity uh, policy, and he's mentioned it a number of times, it isn't just a, a one-off mistake, it's, it's a policy in his mind. And we've seen before, like with the post office, where he mentions it and mentions it and mentions it. And then you see him taking action, either behind his back or right in your face, to implement a crazy policy. So he's talking about the uh, warp speed vaccine. So what do you get from that? First is, is it really a warp speed? What is he doing? This is a, the, the title of the show. You know, what, in fact, is he doing about COVID? What is yeah. he doing about warp speed? How do you make warp speed? Mm -hmm. um, and you know, do we really have a vaccine? Because it seems to me the medical community is divided on it and, and divided is a kind word. In fact, most of the medical community says you gotta be out of your mind. There is no such thing as warp speed vaccine. 
Um, but you know, where are we on that? And this is the second part of my question: How, how does how does that play? You know, with um, uh, with uh, herd immunity, which which one which one is up? Which one which is the flavor of the day, and how do they compare? And what's the average guy, Joe on the street supposed to think? The soup du jour. Yeah, good question, Jay. Um, just a few points. Um, I want to tackle your question, but I just want to make a couple points on the last the last question you've been asking us. And that is, um, the administration hasn't batted on an eyelash about the University of Washington's projection about 410,000 deaths, 410,000 deaths between now and, and January 1st, 2021. Not an eyelash has been batted about it. In fact, University of Washington has been pretty, pretty close to some of these projections of the past. I mean, we're at 200,000 right now, and that's not too far off from where they were estimating back in February. Um, number two is, uh, to Stephanie's point, and on the herd immunity concept, what about the 17% peop of people who are gonna get sick? We don't know enough about this nouveau coronavirus to say what are the lingering effects, health effects that we're gonna, those people are gonna experience that got sick with it. And, and what's the cost to the healthcare system um, if they have lingering uh, ailments uh, for okay, years? But let me add that it's not clear to the, you know, the um, professionals and the scientists that you that you are immune from. That's it. correct. And the operative and, word is immune. And, 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 After you have it, you can have it twice, which means the whole theory fails. Correct. We had a, we had a person in uh, Hong Kong, and we had the gentleman uh, who caught it for the second time in Nevada. And uh, the second time he caught it, he had to go for oxygen therapy. Uh, he didn't go for a ventilator, but he was in serious trouble the second time around. So, yeah, this concept that once you get it, you have your immunity to it, and uh, I, they don't think that's the case just yet. So to get to your uh, question, though, is what is the the um, operation uh, warp speed on the vaccine? Well, Jay, you know, and I know it's a campaign slogan. That's all it was. We knew back in February when we did our interview uh, that um, Donald Trump said we're going to have a vaccine within month, a month or two. And Dr. Fauci back in February said early March said, no, it's going to take 12 to 18 months. And Donald Trump never has never accepted that reality. Um, Dr. Redfield got in trouble yesterday for, you know, suggesting the exact same thing. And um, Donald Trump uses this merely as a campaign slogan to try to um, make things look better and make sure the stock market doesn't just, you know, become disruptive. And so he needs his 50 days before election day. Uh, it's, it's, you know, what can I say? It's, it's rhetoric. outrageous. It's, it's outrageous no, rhetoric. Seen never seen uh, Rachel Maddow so excited about this. I mean, how can you blow off 6 million lives or 2 million lives, whatever her range of numbers were? I, I keep thinking of it. We should dedicate a show. Um, it comes on once a day, maybe, and, and somebody sits there straight-faced and just reads numbers. It, the, the show would be on for months just reading the numbers. Nobody realizes the magnitude of this. Um, but Cynthia, you know, you do have, when you do herd immunity, um, in fact, what's happening now, herd immunity or otherwise, uh, you have a huge effect on the economy. Can you talk about that? Can you talk about where we are in terms of the economy? Because it's not only is he talking about absurd things like herd immunity um, or uh, uh, warp speed vaccines that nobody really believes. Um, he's also encouraging people not to wear masks. He's encouraging people not to respect social distancing. And this is going to create, you know, a, a thousand deaths a day, every day, and tens of thousands of cases. And that ultimately is going to have a profound effect on the economy. Can you talk about it? Of course it will. First, I'd like to say that I kind of think maybe it was a Freudian slip when he said herd mentality, when you looked at all of his supporters behind him and the herd mentality that it takes to keep them in his, um, in his base, um, because it does. And, and, you know, I think something that's really important is um, William Barr is, was on um, and being interviewed and he compared the lockdown. He called it a national lockdown, which we've never even had anyway. But he said that um, he compared the lockdown to house arrest and slavery, which just, yes. I mean, I literally had to sit down when I heard him say it. I thought, how can you 
possibly make that connection? Um, he said it was the greatest intrusion on civil rights uh, in history, or in civil liberties, excuse me, in, in history, in the history of our nation. And I just thought, you have got to be kidding me. This isn't about taking your right to you know, speak or go to church or this isn't <laughs> any of those. This is strictly do something that will save your fellow man. Um, <laughs> and that just floored me. Sorry to just go off on a tangent from, but the economy of course will suffer greatly. Um, small businesses especially will go down. And some of the large corporations might be able to make it through this because, of course, he keeps feeding them money. So they might make it. But the small little guys, thats those are the ones that are going to be hurt, hurt the most. Yeah, at the same time, to talk about that, Congress seems to be locked up on, on, uh, on, on giving any money to the people who are about to go into the street and starve. Well, have you seen what the Republican stuff is has in it? Has all these extra things in it trying to get like he has done from the beginning if he has a bill and then at the last minute they stash something else in the background of it and that's what's happening now and that's why the democrats are standing so firm you know they want oversight this time and not oversight that donald trump can at the last minute say oh i'm going to be the oversight you know they want real oversight and so I think that's an important factor that I know that a lot of times the Democrats are being vilified. Nancy Pelosi is being vilified for not signing this because people need it. The problem is they get very little and there's no real guarantee that they're going to get it anyway because it might just go to the big corporations. So I think some people firmly believe that at the end of this with with the, um, the machinations that are going to take place around the election, we're going to have violence in the streets. But that's accelerated by the fact that by that time, no matter what the rhetoric is from the White House or the Republicans, they, people are going to be hungry. You oh. can't have a government that makes people hungry. Oh. And uh, I, I, don't, I don't have any confidence personally that this, this is going to stay, you know, safe. Oh. But let's, let's turn to the state because the the state also has a huge, big economic problem, the hotels. And we seem to be thrashing around. We talked about this tangentially last time. We seem to be thrashing around. And, and now David Ige is, uh, is, has announced that he's going to do pre-testing, pre-arrival testing starting in the middle of October. Um, Stephanie, is, is that going to work? Well, well, for one thing, any, anything that takes the cost off the state I mean, having it at the door of the plane when you get off, which I don't think they've ever really done. Having people get their own tests somewhere else and then get on the plane and come here. At least there is um, some sense to, you know, getting that cost shifted over to wherever they're coming from. So, I mean, I think the delay is, um, you know, very disappointing, but uh, I'm not sure what the numbers are right now here, but um, I want that, I want to support them doing now what they should have done in March, which is actually get this drawbridge up because um, that we're also going to get some more court action and on this interstate commerce business might, you know, knock us out of our perch for that. And then there's also a lawsuit about that the government has no right to shut anything down. So that the government cannot say go get off the street or go home or no no more than that that has asked, actually been okayed by not the Supreme Court but a, a lower court I um and and so that's going to move on up so that means nobody can tell anybody anything because I guess we uh, would want to avoid slavery well you know you think that people in Hawaii would be respectful of the law and respectful of the rights and health of their neighbors but. That may not be the case. The police have already made 44,000 citations. Great. This is good news that they're doing uh, uh, that. They should have done that. But, but in what tell, that tells you is that 44,000 people have snubbed the nose, their noses. That's right. Um, this is not being respectful. 
because there were um, no consequences. And the other thing is, why is the Ho the Honolulu police doing that? The hotels should be paying for that and making sure those people are under quarantine. And they they do that because that's cost in the city money it doesn't have to be down there giving 44,000 citations. How much did that cost? Who's going to pay for that? We're going to run out of police funds for stuff that applies to, to the people here, the residents. So, so Tim, is this working? What would you, how would you characterize the efforts of the state in, um, you know, dealing with COVID and in more specifically in dealing with um, our, the, the failure, the, the abject failure of our economy? Well, we, we looked at the tail end of the problem and that is the non-compliance of the, the mayor's ordinance, the governor's, you know, um, new set of laws and the, you know, don't make a law, don't make an ordinance, don't make any kind of executive order if you don't have the power and the manpower to implement it, to enforce it. And I saw day in and day out all over Waikiki, um, you know, beach parties taking place under the awnings and, you know, bars in Kaka'aka were cramp packed with, with uh, patrons, nose to nose, no, no masks to be worn. And uh, I saw it all for, for, from the time that uh, things opened up. And I knew right then and there that we were gonna go back to a shutdown because the virus doesn't care about politics, of course, and this is what's gonna happen. But, you know, blame, if you're gonna blame someone, don't blame the people, the, you know, don't, don't punish the entire state as a whole when we have a problem with the few. And the few could have been handled very easily by, by stricter enforcement. It's just that simple. And now we're all paying an economic price further. All the businesses um, have been shuttered back down again. Uh, some and many of them probably won't come back. And that, I think that's a tragic statement that um, if you're going to, like I said, if you're going to put forth a law, then enforce it and make sure it sticks. Yeah. Cynthia, you know, it, it seems to me that our society here in Hawaii, to say nothing about the mainland, is being changed. Uh, that we, we sit and watch and read the paper and um, you figure out what our leaders or, um, well, people who pretend to be our leaders are doing or not doing. But, but while we do that, everything around us is changing. Waikiki is a, you know, is, is a, haunted, a haunted neighborhood. Um, our economy is, even according to you, Hero at university, is, is down in the pits and it's gonna stay in the pits. Um, you know, when we come out again, which that's, that's the way I look at it anyway, um, what are we gonna find here? Is this, what is the state gonna look like in six months or a year, assuming we do that well? Well, one bright spot is that places like Hanama Bay have the best water um, conditions that they've had in a, you know, a decade or more, which is a good thing. So we know that people aren't polluting the waters as much as they were, and they're not destroying the trails and, and backcountry stuff. And, and, you know, I live over here in the countryside here, over on Windward side and going towards North Shore, I don't ever see anybody without a mask when I go out um, to the little stores or anywhere. Well, I mean, right now everybody's locked down, but in this meantime, when we were open, out here on this side, there's a different mentality. I wonder, we have a lot more local folks that live, a lot more Hawaiians that live over here on this side. And like you said, they are more respectful. They do care. Um, and I'm, not to disparage Howie's because I have white skin, but I have breath, so I'm okay. <laughs> but, um, you know, uh, in town, maybe there's a difference of an, of an attitude. So I wonder, we know that in the cities on the mainland have a different attitude than the people out in the country. Um, so maybe that's sort of the case here on the islands too. I'm not sure. But well, you know, it's like we think of ourselves differently in terms of racial relations in terms of respect for the law and all that. But you know, we're, we're not that different from some places on the mainland. And if you look at the whole mainland and you look at the rhetoric going on and, and you look at the confusion, you know, uh, and, and the lack of understanding about exactly what is happening to us, um, we're, not, we're really not that different. So in, in the remaining time, we have a couple of three minutes left to talk. Um, Stephanie, what, you know, what, what, what's gonna happen this week? Is there anything good going to happen with COVID, for example? Is there any chance in a million years, at least this week, um, that Donald Trump um, is going to 
do something. Well, uh, the only thing I can imagine him doing is luring or attracting another creepy crawler out from under the rocks to come in and help him run, quote unquote, his government. So, I mean, Barr has turned out to be such a, a disappointment and uh, actual devastation to um, the Justice Department and all these other people that are making decisions with no medical uh, expertise and this flouting of the experts right on television. I mean, it's kind of like, I mean, my, my observation is that he's kind of like lost, really lost his way. So that are we creeping back up to a point where that is it the 24th amendment that that the cabinet could do something but right. that takes us to the next layer or outer circle which is all of those people and what is the threat against them now with less than two months to go in other words why did the cdc director uh re re rearrange his statement what does he care what was he threatened with Losing the job, is that it? Because you have to leave right away? Or um, is what is the threat that, that Trump has on these people? Well, for somehow nothing? Trump has managed to run the government as a sole proprietorship. He makes all decisions, tells people. I don't know, I don't know how that's happened, but that's, that's what's happened. And therefore, you know, do we have a, a chance at beating COVID? It, it may no. be that his, his remarks uh, over uh, Tim, his, his remarks over, um, you know, uh, herd immunity are will come true, like it or not, because nothing else is is going to happen. That's uh, good to hear. And that all he can do in terms, you know, his, his mission, of course, is to stay in power. But but if he's not going to do anything about COVID, if he's incapable of doing anything about COVID, then his mission is to change the subject and distract us. Is and a, you know, a, a general prediction coming this week would be, well, what new distractions can we expect from him? Yeah. Any, any ideas about that, Tim? Well, yeah, I think you could get more bombshell stories coming out about his um, overt intent to not act with COVID. Um, and maybe he's had all along the idea of herd immunity. Uh, who knows? I, I just think that at some point, all the governors are going to have to get together and say, I'm going to institute a statewide, um, you know, uh, directive that masks are mandatory. N let's not wait for a national one. Let's do it on a state by state basis and let's tackle this so we don't get into the, the herd immunity death toll that awaits us. Yeah, regrettably, he bypasses that, though. You have a number of states now where the governors are saying wear a mask. But Trump is downplaying that, upplaying, downplaying. I can't, I can't figure out what he means when he says up playing, down playing, you know. I mean, the, the confusion is enormous. And, and Cynthia, the one, one more point that we really should cover is that none of this seems to be affecting his base. Every time, you know, you see these articles about, about the outrageous things he's done or hasn't done, the outrageous lies that continue and get worse and get worse. And still the base remains loyal. Um, do we, have we ever figured out why? Well, I think it's because they've been pro programmed intentionally in, in that mass, that herd mentality. Um, I, don't know why. I think they don't leave. They, they've been gaslit so much that they only go by the lies that they've been fed. And they keep such a narrow exposure to any news that they don't really get what's really happening out in the world. All they get is this narrow slice. And, and so, you know, I have a lot of family and friends back in Alabama and that live in the South. And I'm always floored by the things that they say. And they're just sort of regurgitating Fox News. And that's all I ever hear from them is this, like I said, this regurgitation of Fox News, you know? Um, and and then here Trump wants to just blame everybody else for the problems that are happening. When he was asked about the mandate on the George Stephanopoulos interview, he, instead of addressing it, he says, well, the Democrats said they wanted one and Joe Biden said he would have one, but they never did institute it. And I thought, that's because he's not the president, you are. And 
<laughs> you know, here he is trying to blame it on Biden. And I think, you know, so everything that's wrong is somebody else's fault, which is classic narcissistic behavior and thought process. Mm-hmm. And then you have this narrow slice of news that, and, you know, that's all they're ever subject to. Yeah, it's, it's a kind of a reality show, isn't it? Well, we had this discussion at nine o'clock about whether to expect violence in the country uh, getting toward the election. Um, you know, and there are certain things that are structural, which we cannot fix, even if Congress was functional. One of them was, uh, is the Second Amendment, which, which actually is an expression of power. To have guns is to have power. Um, and the other, of course, is the Electoral College and the way the Senate is structured. And what I thought it was interesting is, uh, you know, in, in response to the question we posed, um, namely, how can you fix that? Well, David Louis said, you know, it'll take generations because, and you touched on this, uh, Cynthia, is the, the education of the country has been lacking and still is. You know, one thing, in, I don't want to go out too long here, but one, one thing that really struck me was they took a survey of people who... Um, people who believe that the Jews created the Holocaust. And um, of, of uh, young adults, I think age up to 28, 10% of them, 10% of the people surveyed believed that the Jews created the Holocaust. They had no idea. And, and so I, I suggest to you that when you, you know, treat the whole thing as a reality show or a football game, uh, what you're talking about is a complete failure of education. And I don't know how you fix that. It takes a while. And the base is going to remain educated by Trump. He's their teacher, mentor, you know, their G- Jim Jones, as the case may be. Okay, last comments, Tim. What do we have to look for here? Again, more, out, um, more bombshell stories coming out, either through Woodward's book or uh, people blowing the whistle on the administration. Yeah, and watch out for that woman who said that he grabbed her and put his tongue down her throat. You'll hear more about that later today. Uh, Stephanie, how about you? Uh, that we can ignore that because everybody else will. The, um, yeah, the Fox and um, the other outlets, Limbaugh, are just pumping, pumping, pumping. Things that um, I, I, do, I don't even care about anymore, like they're bringing in um, the, the fired uh, FBI director. They're still on stuff from four years ago. So there, and then in addition to continuing all of these, uh, these uh, ridiculous. Yeah. yeah, right. It's almost like this is 2016 revisited, isn't it? It's like two separate places. So they're ginning up and that, uh, you know, what's his name from um, George, South Carolina, you know, who was McCain's sidekick. And he is such a disappointment. He's just pushing on this because he's judicial committee in the yeah. Senate. Yeah. So, We've just got, it's another agenda entirely. By the way, Fox has to, re- dis, has to reorganize. They're, t- they're taking 10% of it down because of income. Or So watch for that. So some people are going. It won't be Hannity or Ingraham, but- um, yeah. Money rules, money rules. We live in a, in a world of greed and corruption. Uh, okay, you got 30 seconds left, uh, Cynthia. What do you got to say? You have to be very, very careful because we got to remember Caputo just made a statement saying that we should shoot Democrat published uh, um, uh, politicians in the street. Isn't that what he said? Shoot them dead in the street, I believe was his exact um, thing that he said. So what you said about the violence, we need to start making plans now to avoid it um, instead of waiting until it happens and then reacting to it. I think it's important that we start now planning on how we're going to deal with it because it's going to happen. Yeah, country's changing. Thank you, Tim. Uh, Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Cynthia. Great to have these discussions. Got to keep on it. And we we keep counting. We got to keep counting. Uh, Thanks so much. Aloha till next week. Mm